Introduction of the May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Sunny Memories of Foreign Lands, etc. Published in 1855 in Boston, Massachusetts. Introduction Mr. G. B. Emerson, in his late report to the legislature of Massachusetts on the trees and shrubs of that state, thus describes the May flower. Often from beneath the edge of a snowbank are seen rising the fragrant, pearly white, or rose-colored flowers of this earliest harbinger of spring. It abounds in the edges of the woods about Plymouth, as elsewhere, and must have been the first flower to salute the storm-beaten crew of the Mayflower on the conclusion of their first terrible winter. Their descendants have thence piously derived the name, although its bloom is often passed before the coming in of May. No flower could be more appropriately selected as an emblem token of the descendants of the Puritans. Though so fragrant and graceful, it is invariably the product of the hardest and most rocky soils, and seems to draw its ethereal beauty of color and wealth of perfume rather from the air than from the slight hold which its rootlets take of the earth. It may often be found in fullest beauty, matting a granite lodge, with scarcely any perceptible soil for its support. What better emblem of that faith and hope and piety by which our fathers were supported in dreary and barren enterprises, and which drew their life and fragrance from heaven more than earth? The Mayflower was, therefore, many years since selected by the author as the title of a series of New England sketches. That work has comparatively a limited circulation and is now entirely out of print. Its articles are republished in the present volume with other miscellaneous writings, which have from time to time appeared in different periodicals. They have been written in all moods, from the gayest to the gravest. They are connected, in many cases, with the memory of friends and scenes most dear. There are those now scattered through the world who will remember the social literary parties of Cincinnati, for whose genial meetings many of these articles were prepared. With most affectionate remembrances, the author dedicates the book to the yet surviving members of the semicolon. Andover april eighteen fifty five end of introduction chapter one part one of the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter one uncle lot part one and so i am to write a story but of what and where shall it be radiant with the sky of italy or eloquent with the beau ideal of greece shall it breathe odour and languor from the orient or chivalry from the occident or gaiety from france or vigour from england no no these are all too old too romance-like too obviously picturesque for me no let me turn to my own land my own new england the land of bright fires and strong hearts the land of deeds and not of words the land of fruits and not of flowers the land often spoken against yet always respected the latchet of whose shoes the nations of the earth are not worthy to unloose now from this very heroic apostrophe you may suppose that i have something very heroic to tell by no means 
it is merely a little introductory breeze of patriotism such as occasionally brushes over every mind bearing on its wings the remembrance of all we ever loved or cherished in the land of our early years and if it should seem to be rhodomontade to any people in other parts of the earth let them only imagine it to be said about old kentuck old england or any other corner of the world in which they happen to be born and they will find it quite rational but as touching our story it is time to begin did you ever see the little village of newbury in new england i dare say you never did for it was just one of those out-of-the-way places where nobody ever came unless they came on purpose a green little hollow wedged like a bird's nest between half a dozen high hills that kept off the wind and kept out foreigners so that the little place was as straightly sui generis as if there were not another in the world the inhabitants were all of that respectable old steadfast family who make it a point to be born bred married die and be buried all in the self-same spot there were just so many houses and just so many people lived in them and nobody ever seemed to be sick or to die either at least while i was there the natives grew old till they could not grow any older and then they stood still and lasted from generation to generation there was too an unchangeability about all the externals of newbury here was a red house and there was a brown house and across the way was a yellow house and there was a straggling rail fence or a tribe of mullen stalks between the minister lived here and squire moses lived there and deacon hart lived under the hill and messrs nadab and abihu peters lived by the cross-road and the old widder smith lived by the meeting-house and ebenezer camp kept a shoemaker's shop on one side and patience mosley kept a milliner's shop in front and there was old comfort scran who kept store for the whole town and sold axe-heads brass thimbles liquorice ball fancy handkerchiefs and everything else you can think of here too was the general post-office where you might see letters marvellously folded directed wrong side upward stamped with a thimble and superscribed to some of the dollies or pollies or peters or moseses aforenamed or not named for the rest as to manners morals arts and sciences the people in newbury always went to their parties at three o'clock in the afternoon and came home before dark always stopped all work the minute the sun was down on saturday night always went to meeting on sunday had a schoolhouse with all the ordinary inconveniences were in neighbourly charity with each other read their bibles feared their god and were content with such things as they had the best philosophy after all such was the place into which master james benton made an eruption in the year eighteen hundred and no matter what now this james is to be our hero and he is just the hero for a sensation at least so you would have thought if you had been in newbury the week after his arrival master james was one of those whole-hearted energetic yankees who rise in the world as naturally as cork does in water he possessed a great share of that characteristic national trait so happily denominated cuteness which signifies an ability to do everything without trying and to know everything without learning and to make more use of one's ignorance than other people do of their knowledge this quality in james was mingled with an elasticity of animal spirits a buoyant cheerfulness of mind which though found in the new england character perhaps as often as anywhere else is not ordinarily regarded as one of its distinguishing traits as to the personal appearance of our hero we have not much to say of it not half so much as the girls in newbury found it necessary to remark the first sabbath that he shone out in the meeting-house there was a saucy frankness of countenance a knowing roguery of eye a joviality and prankishness of demeanour that was wonderfully captivating especially to the ladies it is true that master james had an uncommonly comfortable opinion of himself 
a full faith that there was nothing in creation that he could not learn and could not do and this faith was maintained with an abounding and triumphant joyfulness that fairly carried your sympathies along with him and made you feel quite as much delighted with his qualifications and prospects as he felt himself there are two kinds of self-sufficiency one is amusing and the other is provoking his was the amusing kind it seemed in truth to be only the buoyancy and overflow of a vivacious mind delighted with everything delightful in himself or others he was always ready to magnify his own praise but quite as ready to exalt his neighbour if the channel of discourse ran that way his own perfections being more completely within his knowledge he rejoiced in them more constantly but if those of any one else came within the same range he was quite as much astonished and edified as if they had been his own master james at the time of his transit to the town of newbury was only eighteen years of age so that it was difficult to say which predominated in him most the boy or the man the belief that he could and the determination that he would be something in the world had caused him to abandon his home and with all his worldly effects tied in a blue cotton pocket handkerchief to proceed to seek his fortune in newbury and never did stranger in yankee village rise to promotion with more unparalleled rapidity or boast a greater plurality of employment he figured as schoolmaster all the week and as chorister on sundays and taught singing and reading in the evenings besides studying latin and greek with the minister nobody knew when thus fitting for college while he seemed to be doing everything else in the world besides james understood every art and craft of popularity and made himself mightily at home in all the chimney corners of the region round about knew the geography of everybody's cider barrel and apple bin helping himself and every one else therefrom with all bountifulness rejoicing in the good things of this life devouring the old lady's doughnuts and pumpkin pies with most flattering appetite and appearing equally to relish everybody and thing that came in his way the degree and versatility of his acquirements were truly wonderful he knew all about arithmetic and history and all about catching squirrels and planting corn made poetry and hoe handles with equal celerity wound yarn and took out grease spots for old ladies and made nosegays and knick-knacks for young ones caught trout saturday afternoons and discussed doctrines on sundays with equal adroitness and effect in short mr james moved on through the place victorious happy and glorious welcomed and privileged by everybody in every place and when he had told his last ghost story and fairly flourished himself out of doors at the close of a long winter's evening you might see the hard face of the good man of the house still phosphorescent with his departing radiance and hear him exclaim in a paroxysm of admiration that Jemison's talk really did beat all that he was certainly most a miraculous creature it was wonderfully contrary to the buoyant activity of master james's mind to keep a school he had moreover so much of the boy and the rogue in his composition that he could not be strict with the iniquities of the curly pates under his charge and when he saw how determinately every little heart was boiling over with mischief and motion he felt in his soul more disposed to join in and help them to a frolic than to lay justice to the line as was meet this would have made a sad case had it not been that the activity of the master's mind communicated itself to his charge just as the reaction of one brisk little spring will fill a manufactory with motion so that there was more of an impulse towards study in the golden good-natured day of james benton than in the time of all that went before or came after him 
but when school was out james's spirits foamed over as naturally as a tumbler of soda-water and he could jump over benches and burst out of doors with as much rapture as the veriest little elf in his company then you might have seen him stepping homeward with a most felicitous expression of countenance occasionally reaching his hand through the fence for a bunch of currants or over it after a flower or bursting into some back yard to help an old lady empty her wash-tub or stopping to pay his devoirs to aunt this or mistress that for james well knew the importance of the powers that be and always kept the sunny side of the old ladies we shall not answer for james's general flirtations which were sundry and manifold for he had just the kindly heart that fell in love with everything in feminine shape that came in his way and if he had not been blessed with an equal facility in falling out again we do not know whatever would have become of him but at length he came into an abiding captivity and it is quite time that he should for having devoted thus much space to the illustration of our hero it is fit we should do something in behalf of our heroine and therefore we must beg the reader's attention while we draw a diagram or two that will assist him in gaining a right idea of her do you see yonder brown house with its broad roof sloping almost to the ground on one side and a great unsupported sun-bonnet of a piazza shooting out over the front door you must often have noticed it you have seen its tall well sweep relieved against the clear evening sky or observed the feather-beds and bolsters lounging out of its chamber windows on a still summer morning you recollect its gate that swung with a chain and a great stone its pantry window latticed with little brown slabs and looking out upon a forest of bean-poles you remember the zephyrs that used to play among its pea-brush and shake the long tassels of its corn-patch and how vainly any zephyr might essay to perform similar flirtations with the considerate cabbages that were solemnly vegetating near by then there was the whole neighbourhood of purple-leaved beets and feathery parsnips there were the billows of gooseberry bushes rolled up by the fence interspersed with rows of quince trees and far off in one corner was one little patch penuriously devoted to ornament which flamed with marigolds poppies snappers and four o'clocks then there was a little box by itself with one rose geranium in it which seemed to look around the garden as much like a stranger as a french dancing-master in a yankee meeting-house that is the dwelling of uncle lot griswold uncle lot as he was commonly called had a character that a painter would sketch for its lights and contrasts rather than its symmetry he was a chestnut burr abounding with briars without and with substantial goodness within he had the strong-grained practical sense the calculating worldly wisdom of his class of people in new england he had too a kindly heart but all the strata of his character were crossed by a vein of surly petulance that half-way between joke and earnest coloured everything that he said and did if you asked a favour of uncle lot he generally kept you arguing half an hour to prove that you really needed it and to tell you that he could not all the while be troubled with helping one body or another all which time you might observe him regularly making his preparations to grant your request and see by an odd glimmer of his eye that he was preparing to let you hear the conclusion of the whole matter which was well well i guess i'll go on the hall i suppose i must at least so off he would go and work while the day lasted and then wind up with a farewell exhortation not to be a callin on your neighbours when you could get along without if any of uncle lot's neighbours were in any trouble he was always at hand to tell them that they shouldn't a done so that it was strange they couldn't had more sense and then to close his exhortations by labouring more diligently than any to bring them out of their difficulties groaning in spirit meanwhile that folks would make people so much trouble uncle lot father wants to know if you will lend him your hoe to-day says a little boy making his way across a cornfield why don't your father use his own hoe ours is broke 
broke how came it broke i broke it yesterday trying to hit a squirrel what business had you to be hitting squirrels with a hoe say but father wants to borrow yours why don't you have that mended it's a great pester to have everybody usin a body's things well i can borrow one somewhere else i suppose says the suppliant after the boy has stumbled across the ploughed ground and is fairly over the fence uncle lot calls hallo there you little rascal what are you going off without the hoe for i didn't know as you meant to lend it i didn't say i wouldn't did i here come and take it stay i'll bring it and do tell your father not to be a lettin you hunt squirrels with his hoes next time uncle lot's household consisted of aunt sally his wife and an only son and daughter the former at the time our story begins was at a neighbouring literary institution aunt sally was precisely as clever as easy to be entreated and kindly in externals as her helpmate was the reverse she was one of those respectable pleasant old ladies whom you might often have met on the way to church on a sunday equipped with a great fan and a psalm book and carrying some dried orange peel or a stalk of fennel to give to the children if they were sleepy in meeting she was as cheerful and domestic as the tea-kettle that sung by her kitchen fire and slipped along among uncle lot's angles and peculiarities as if there never was anything the matter in the world and the same mantle of sunshine seemed to have fallen on miss grace her only daughter pretty in her person and pleasant in her ways endowed with native self-possession and address lively and chatty having a mind and a will of her own yet good-humoured withal miss grace was a universal favourite it would have puzzled a city lady to understand how grace who never was out of newbury in her life knew the way to speak and act and behave on all occasions exactly as if she had been taught how she was just one of those wild flowers which you may sometimes see waving its little head in the woods and looking so civilized and garden-like that you wonder if it really did come up and grow there by nature she was an adept in all household concerns and there was something amazingly pretty in her energetic way of bustling about and putting things to rights like most yankee damsels she had a longing after the tree of knowledge and having exhausted the literary fountains of a district school she fell to reading whatsoever came in her way true she had but little to read but what she perused she had her own thoughts upon so that a person of information in talking with her would feel a constant wondering pleasure to find that she had so much more to say of this that and the other thing than he expected uncle lot like every one else felt the magical brightness of his daughter and was delighted with her praises as might be discerned by his often finding occasion to remark that he didn't see why the boys need to be all the time a-comin to see grace for she was nothin so extraordinary after all about all matters and things at home she generally had her own way while uncle lot would scold and give up with a regular good grace that was quite creditable father says grace i want to have a party next week you shan't go to havin your parties grace i always have to eat bits and ends a fortnight after you have one and i won't have it so and so uncle lot walked out and aunt sally and miss grace proceeded to make the cake and pies for the party when uncle lot came home he saw a long array of pies and rows of cakes on the kitchen table grace 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 i say what is all this here flummery for why it is to eat father said grace with a good-natured look of consciousness uncle lot tried his best to look sour but his visage began to wax comical as he looked at his married daughter so he said nothing but quietly sat down to his dinner father said grace after dinner we shall want two more candlesticks next week why can't you have your party with what you've got no father we want two more i can't afford it grace there's no sort of use aunt and you shan't have any oh father now do said grace 
i won't neither said uncle lot as he sallied out of the house and took the road to comfort scran's store in half an hour he returned again and fumbling in his pocket and drawing forth a candlestick levelled it at grace there's your candlestick but father i said i wanted two why can't you make one do no i can't i must have two well then there's t'other and here's a falderall for you to tie round your neck so saying he bolted for the door and took himself off with all speed it was much after this fashion that matters commonly went on in the brown house but having tarried long on the way we must proceed with the main story james thought miss grace was a glorious girl and as to what miss grace thought of master james perhaps it would not have been developed had she not been called to stand on the defensive for him with uncle lot for from the time that the whole village of newbury began to be wholly given unto the praise of master james uncle lot set his face as a flint against him from the laudable fear of following the multitude he therefore made conscience of stoutly gainsaying everything that was said in his behalf which as james was in high favour with aunt sally he had frequent opportunities to do so when miss grace perceived that uncle lot did not like our hero as much as he ought to do she of course was bound to like him well enough to make up for it certain it is that they were remarkably happy in finding opportunities of being acquainted that james waited on her as a matter of course from singing school that he volunteered making a new box for her geranium on an improved plan and above all that he was remarkably particular in his attentions to aunt sally a stroke of policy which showed that james had a natural genius for this sort of matters even when emerging from the meeting-house in full glory with flute and psalm-book under his arm he would stop to ask her how she did and if it was cold weather he would carry her foot-stove all the way home from meeting discoursing upon the sermon and other serious matters as aunt sally observed in the pleasantest prettiest way that ever ye see this flute was one of the crying sins of james in the eyes of uncle lot james was particularly fond of it because he had learned to play on it by intuition and on the decease of the old pitch-pipe which was slain by a fall from the gallery he took the liberty to introduce the flute in its place for this and other sins and for the good reasons above named uncle lot's countenance was not towards james neither could he be moved to himward by any manner of means to all aunt sally's good words and kind speeches he had only to say that he didn't like him that he hated to see him a manifesting and glorifying there in the front gallery sundays and a acting everywhere as if he was master of all he didn't like it and he wouldn't but our hero was no whit cast down or discomfited by the malcontent aspect of uncle lot on the contrary when report was made to him of divers of his hard speeches he only shrugged his shoulders with a very satisfied air and remarked that he knew a thing or two for all that why james said his companion and chief counsellor do you think grace likes you i don't know said our hero with a comfortable appearance of certainty but you can't get her james if uncle lot is cross about it fudge i can make uncle lot like me if i have a mind to try well then jim you'll have to give up that flute of yours i tell you now fa so la i can make him like me and my flute too why how will you do it oh i'll work it said our hero well jim i tell you now you don't know uncle lot if you say so for he is just the saddest critter in his way that ever you saw i do know uncle lot though better than most folks he is no more cross than i am and as to his being set you have nothing to do but make him think he is in his own way when he is in yours that is all well said the other but you see i don't believe it and i'll bet you a grey squirrel that i'll go there this very evening and get him to like me and my flute both said james 
accordingly the late sunshine of that afternoon shone full on the yellow buttons of james as he proceeded to the place of conflict it was a bright beautiful evening a thunderstorm had just cleared away and the silver clouds lay rolled up in masses around the setting sun the raindrops were sparkling and winking to each other over the ends of the leaves and all the bluebirds and robins breaking forth into song made the little green valley as merry as a musical box james's soul was always overflowing with that kind of poetry which consists in feeling unspeakably happy and it is not to be wondered at considering where he was going that he should feel in a double ecstasy on the present occasion he stepped gaily along occasionally springing over a fence to the right to see whether the rain had swollen the trout brook or to the left to notice the ripening of mr somebody's watermelons for james always had an eye on all his neighbours matters as well as his own in this way he proceeded till he arrived at the picket fence that marked the commencement of uncle lot's ground here he stopped to consider just then four or five sheep walked up and began also to consider a loose picket which was hanging just ready to drop off and james began to look at the sheep well mister said he as he observed the leader judiciously drawing himself through the gap in with you just what i wanted and having waited a moment to ascertain that all the company were likely to follow he ran with all haste towards the house and swinging open the gate pressed all breathless to the door uncle lot there are four or five sheep in your garden uncle lot dropped his whetstone and scythe i'll drive them out said our hero and with that he ran down the garden alley and made a furious descent on the enemy bestirring himself as bunyan says lustily and with good courage till every sheep had skipped out much quicker than it skipped in and then springing over the fence he seized a great stone and nailed on the picket so effectually that no sheep could possibly encourage the hope of getting in again this was all the work of a minute and he was back again but so exceedingly out of breath that it was necessary for him to stop a moment and rest himself uncle lot looked ungraciously satisfied what under the canopy set you to scampering so said he i could a driv out them critters myself if you are at all particular about driving them out yourself i can let them in again said james uncle lot looked at him with an odd sort of twinkle in the corner of his eye s'pose i must ask you to walk in said he much obliged said james but i am in a great hurry so saying he started in very business-like fashion towards the gate you'd better just stop a minute can't stay a minute i don't see what possesses you to be all the while in sich a hurry a body would think you had all creation on your shoulders just my situation uncle lot said james swinging open the gate well at any rate have a drink of cider can't ye said uncle lot who was now quite engaged to have his own way in the case james found it convenient to accept this invitation and uncle lot was twice as good-natured as if he had stayed in the first of the matter once fairly forced into the premises james thought fit to forget his long walk and excess of business especially as about that moment aunt sally and miss grace returned from an afternoon call you may be sure that the last thing these respectable ladies looked for was to find uncle lot and master james tete a tete over a pitcher of cider and when as they entered our hero looked up with something of a mischievous air miss grace in particular was so puzzled that it took her at least a quarter of an hour to untie her bonnet strings but james stayed and acted the agreeable to perfection first he must needs go down into the garden to look at uncle lot's wonderful cabbages and then he promenaded all around the corn patch stopping every few moments and looking up with an appearance of great gratification as if he had never seen such corn in his life and then he examined uncle lot's favourite apple-tree with an expression of wonderful interest i never he broke forth having stationed himself against the fence opposite to it what kind of an apple-tree is that it's a bell-flower or something another said uncle lot 
why where did you get it i never saw such apples said our hero with his eyes still fixed on the tree uncle lot pulled up a stalk or two of weeds and threw them over the fence just to show that he did not care anything about the matter and then he came up and stood by james nothing so remarkable as i know on said he just then grace came to say that supper was ready once seated at table it was astonishing to see the perfect and smiling assurance with which our hero continued his addresses to uncle lot it sometimes goes a great way towards making people like us to take it for granted that they do already and upon this principle james proceeded he talked laughed told stories and joked with the most fearless assurance occasionally seconding his words by looking uncle lot in the face with a countenance so full of good will as would have melted any snowdrift of prejudices in the world james also had one natural accomplishment more courtier like than all the diplomacy in europe and that was the gift of feeling a real interest for anybody in five minutes so that if he began to please in jest he generally ended in earnest with great simplicity of mind he had a natural tact for seeing into others and watched their motions with the same delight with which a child gazes at the wheels and springs of a watch to see what it will do the rough exterior and latent kindness of uncle lot were quite a spirit-stirring study and when tea was over as he and grace happened to be standing together in the front door he broke forth i do really like your father grace do you said grace yes i do he has something in him and i like him all the better for having to fish it out well i hope you will make him like you said grace unconsciously and then she stopped and looked a little ashamed james was too well bred to see this or look as if grace meant any more than she said a kind of breeding not always attendant on more fashionable polish so he only answered i think i shall grace though i doubt whether i can get him to own it he is the kindest man that ever was said grace and he always acts as if he was ashamed of it james turned a little away and looked at the bright evening sky which was glowing like a calm golden sea and over it was the silver new moon with one little star to hold the candle for her he shook some bright drops off from a rose-bush near by and watched to see them shine as they fell while grace stood very quietly waiting for him to speak again grace said he at last i am going to college this fall so you told me yesterday said grace james stooped down over grace's geranium and began to busy himself with pulling off all the dead leaves remarking in the meanwhile and if i do get him to like me grace will you like me too i like you now very well said grace come grace you know what i mean said james looking steadfastly at the top of the apple tree well i wish then you would understand what i mean without my saying any more about it said grace oh to be sure i will said our hero looking up with a very intelligent air and so as aunt sally would say the matter was settled with no words about it end of chapter one part one chapter one part two of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter one uncle lot part two now shall we narrate how our hero as he saw uncle lot approaching the door had the impudence to take out his flute and put the parts together arranging and adjusting the stops with great composure uncle lot said he looking up this is the best flute that ever i saw i hate them tooting critters said uncle lot snappishly 
i declare i wonder how you can said james for i do think they exceed so saying he put the flute to his mouth and ran up and down a long flourish there what do you think of that said he looking in uncle lot's face with much delight uncle lot turned and marched into the house but soon faced to the right about and came out again for james was fingering yankee doodle that appropriate national air for the descendants of the puritans uncle lot's patriotism began to bestir itself and now if it had been anything as he said but that our flute as it was he looked more than once at james's fingers how under the sun could you learn to do that said he oh it's easy enough said james proceeding with another tune and having played it through he stopped a moment to examine the joints of his flute and in the meantime addressed uncle lot you can't think how grand this is for pitching tunes i always pitch the tunes on sunday with it yes but i don't think it's a right and fit instrument for the lord's house said uncle lot why not it is only a kind of a long pitch pipe you see said james and seeing the old one is broken and this will answer i don't see why it is not better than nothing why yes it may be better than nothing said uncle lot but as i always tell grace and my wife it ain't the right kind of instrument after all it ain't solemn solemn said james that is according as you work it see here now so saying he struck up old hundred and proceeded through it with great perseverance there now said he well well i don't know but it is said uncle lot but as i said at first i don't like the look of it in meetin but yet you really think it is better than nothing said james for you see i couldn't pitch my tunes without it maybe tis said uncle lot but that isn't sayin much this however was enough for master james who soon after departed with his flute in his pocket and grace's last words in his heart soliloquizing as he shut the gate there now i hope aunt sally won't go to praising me for just so sure as she does i shall have it all to do over again james was right in his apprehension uncle lot could be privately converted but not brought to open confession and when the next morning aunt sally remarked in the kindness of her heart well i always knew you would come to like james uncle lot only responded who said i did like him but i'm sure you seemed to like him last night why i couldn't turn him out o doors could i i don't think nothing of him but what i always did but it was to be remarked that uncle lot contented himself at this time with the mere general avowal without running it into particulars as was formerly his wont it was evident that the ice had begun to melt but it might have been a long time in dissolving had not collateral incidents assisted it so happened that about this time george griswold the only son before referred to returned to his native village after having completed his theological studies at a neighbouring institution it is interesting to mark the gradual development of mind and heart from the time that the white-headed bashful boy quits the country village for college to the period when he returns a formed and matured man to notice how gradually the rust of early prejudices begins to cleave from him how his opinions like his handwriting pass from the cramped and limited forms of a country school into that confirmed and characteristic style which is to mark the man for life in george this change was remarkably striking he was endowed by nature with uncommon acuteness of feeling and fondness for reflection qualities as likely as any to render a child backward and uninteresting in early life when he left newbury for college he was a taciturn and apparently phlegmatic boy only evincing sensibility by blushing and looking particularly stupefied whenever anybody spoke to him vacation after vacation passed and he returned more and more an altered being 
and he who once shrunk from the eye of the deacon and was ready to sink if he met the minister now moved about among the dignitaries of the place with all the composure of a superior being it was only to be regretted that while the mind improved the physical energies declined and that every visit to his home found him paler thinner and less prepared in body for the sacred profession to which he had devoted himself but now he was returned a minister a real minister with a right to stand in the pulpit and preach and what a joy and glory to aunt sally and to uncle lot if he were not ashamed to own it the first sunday after he came it was known far and near that george griswold was to preach and never was a more ready and expectant audience as the time for reading the first psalm approached you might see the white-headed men turning their faces attentively towards the pulpit the anxious and expectant old women with their little black bonnets bent forward to see him rise there were the children looking because everybody else looked there was uncle lot in the front pew his face considerately adjusted there was aunt sally seeming as pleased as a mother could seem and miss grace lifting her sweet face to her brother like a flower to the sun there was our friend james in the front gallery his joyous countenance a little touched with sobriety and expectation in short a more embarrassingly attentive audience never greeted the first effort of a young minister under these circumstances there was something touching in the fervent self-forgetfulness which characterized the first exercises of the morning something which moved every one in the house the devout poetry of his prayer rich with the orientalism of scripture and eloquent with the expression of strong yet chastened emotion breathed over his audience like music hushing every one to silence and beguiling every one to feeling in the sermon there was the strong intellectual nerve the constant occurrence of argument and statement which distinguishes a new england discourse but it was touched with life by the intense yet half subdued feeling with which he seemed to utter it like the rays of the sun it enlightened and melted at the same moment the strong peculiarities of new england doctrine involving as they do all the hidden machinery of mind all the mystery of its divine relations and future progression and all the tremendous uncertainties of its eternal good or ill seemed to have dwelt in his mind to have burned in his thoughts to have wrestled with his powers and they gave to his manner the fervency almost of another world while the exceeding paleness of his countenance and a tremulousness of voice that seemed to spring from bodily weakness touched the strong workings of his mind with a pathetic interest as if the being so early absorbed in another world could not be long for this when the services were over the congregation dispersed with the air of people who had felt rather than heard and all the criticism that followed was similar to that of old deacon hart an upright shrewd man who as he lingered a moment at the church door turned and gazed with unwonted feeling at the young preacher he's a blessed creature said he the tears actually making their way to his eyes i ain't been so near heaven this many a day he's a blessed creature of the lord that's my mind about him as for our friend james he was at first sobered then deeply moved and at last wholly absorbed by the discourse and it was only when meeting was over that he began to think where he really was with all his versatile activity james had a greater depth of mental capacity than he was himself aware of and he began to feel a sort of electric affinity for the mind that had touched him in a way so new and when he saw the mild minister standing at the foot of the pulpit stairs he made directly towards him i do want to hear more from you said he with a face full of earnestness may i walk home with you it is a long and warm walk said george smiling oh i don't care for that if it does not trouble you said james and leave being gained 
you might have seen them slowly passing along under the trees james pouring forth all the floods of inquiry which the sudden impulse of his mind had brought out and supplying his guide with more questions and problems for solution than he could have gone through with in a month i cannot answer all your questions now said he as they stopped at uncle lot's gate well then when will you said james eagerly let me come home with you to-night the minister smiled assent and james departed so full of new thoughts that he passed grace without even seeing her from that time a friendship commenced between the two which was a beautiful illustration of the affinities of opposites it was like a friendship between morning and evening all freshness and sunshine on one side and all gentleness and peace on the other the young minister worn by long continued ill health by the fervency of his own feelings and the gravity of his own reasonings found pleasure in the healthful buoyancy of a youthful unexhausted mind while james felt himself sobered and made better by the moonlight tranquillity of his friend it is one mark of a superior mind to understand and be influenced by the superiority of others and this was the case with james the ascendancy which his new friend acquired over him was unlimited and did more in a month towards consolidating and developing his character than all the four years course of a college our religious habits are likely always to retain the impression of the first seal which stamped them and in this case it was a peculiarly happy one the calmness the settled purpose the mild devotion of his friend formed a just alloy to the energetic and reckless buoyancy of james's character and awakened in him a set of feelings without which the most vigorous mind must be incomplete the effect of the ministrations of the young pastor in awakening attention to the subjects of his calling in the village was marked and of a kind which brought pleasure to his own heart but like all other excitement it tends to exhaustion and it was not long before he sensibly felt the decline of the powers of life to the best regulated mind there is something bitter in the relinquishment of projects for which we have been long and laboriously preparing and there is something far more bitter in crossing the long cherished expectations of friends all this george felt he could not bear to look on his mother hanging on his words and following his steps with eyes of almost childish delight on his singular father whose whole earthly ambition was bound up in his success and think how soon the candle of their old age must be put out when he returned from a successful effort it was painful to see the old man so evidently delighted and so anxious to conceal his triumph as he would seat himself in his chair and begin with george that our doctrine is rather of a puzzler but you seem to think you've got the run on t i should really like to know what business you have to think you know better than other folks about it and though he would cavil most courageously at all george's explanations yet you might perceive through all that he was inly uplifted to hear how his boy could talk if george was engaged in argument with any one else he would sit by with his head bowed down looking out from under his shaggy eyebrows with a shamefaced satisfaction very unusual with him expressions of affection from the naturally gentle are not half so touching as those which are forced out from the hard favoured and severe and george was affected even to pain by the evident pride and regard of his father he never said so much to anybody before thought he and what will he do if i die in such thoughts as these grace found her brother engaged one still autumn morning as he stood leaning against the garden fence what are you solemnizing here for this bright day brother george said she as she bounded down the alley the young man turned and looked on her happy face with a sort of twilight smile how happy you are grace said he to be sure i am and you ought to be too because you are better i am happy grace that is i hope i shall be 
you are sick i know you are said grace you look worn out oh i wish your heart could spring once as mine does i am not well dear grace and i fear i never shall be said he turning away and fixing his eyes on the fading trees opposite oh george dear george don't don't say that you'll break all our hearts said grace with tears in her own eyes yes but it is true sister i do not feel it on my own account so much as however he added it will all be the same in heaven it was but a week after this that a violent cold hastened the progress of debility into a confirmed malady he sunk very fast aunt sally with the self-deceit of a fond and cheerful heart thought every day that he would be better and uncle lot resisted conviction with all the obstinate pertinacity of his character while the sick man felt that he had not the heart to undeceive them james was now at the house every day exhausting all his energy and invention in the case of his friend and any one who had seen him in his hours of recklessness and glee could scarcely recognize him as the being whose step was so careful whose eye so watchful whose voice and touch were so gentle as he moved around the sick-bed but the same quickness which makes a mind buoyant in gladness often makes it gentlest and most sympathetic in sorrow it was now nearly morning in the sick-room george had been restless and feverish all night but towards day he fell into a slight slumber and james sat by his side almost holding his breath lest he should waken him it was yet dusk but the sky was brightening with a solemn glow and the stars were beginning to disappear all save the bright and morning one which standing alone in the east looked tenderly through the casement like the eye of our heavenly father watching over us when all earthly friendships are fading george awoke with a placid expression of countenance and fixing his eyes on the brightening sky murmured faintly the sweet immortal morning sheds its blushes round the spheres a moment after a shade passed over his face he pressed his fingers over his eyes and the tears dropped silently on his pillow george dear george said james bending over him it's my friends it's my father my mother said he faintly jesus christ will watch over them said james soothingly oh yes i know he will for he loved his own which were in the world he loved them unto the end but i am dying and before i have done any good oh do not say so said james think think what you have done if only for me god bless you for it god will bless you for it it will follow you to heaven it will bring me there yes i will do as you have taught me i will give my life my soul my whole strength to it and then you will not have lived in vain george smiled and looked upward his face was as that of an angel and james in his warmth continued it is not i alone who can say this we all bless you every one in this place blesses you you will be had in everlasting remembrance by some hearts here i know bless god said george we do said james i bless him that i ever knew you we all bless him and we love you and shall for ever the glow that had kindled over the pale face of the invalid again faded as he said but james i must i ought to tell my father and mother i ought to and how can i at that moment the door opened and uncle lot made his appearance he seemed struck with the paleness of george's face and coming to the side of the bed he felt his pulse and laid his hand anxiously on his forehead and clearing his voice several times inquired if he didn't feel a little better no father said george then taking his hand he looked anxiously in his face and seemed to hesitate a moment father he began you know that we ought to submit to god there was something in his expression at this moment which flashed the truth into the old man's mind he dropped his son's hand with an exclamation of agony and turning quickly left the room father father said grace trying to rouse him as he stood with his arms folded by the kitchen window get away child said he roughly father mother says breakfast is ready i don't want any breakfast said he turning short about sally what are you fixing in that air porringer 
oh it's only a little tea for george twill comfort him up and make him feel better poor fellow you won't make him feel better he's gone said uncle lot hoarsely oh dear heart no said aunt sally be still a contradicting me i won't be contradicted all the time by nobody the short of the case is that george is going to die just as we've got him ready to be a minister and all and i wish to pity i was in my grave myself and so said uncle lot as he plunged out of the door and shut it after him it is well for man that there is one being who sees the suffering heart as it is and not as it manifests itself through the repellences of outward infirmity and who perhaps feels more for the stern and wayward than for those whose gentler feelings win for them human sympathy with all his singularities there was in the heart of uncle lot a depth of religious sincerity but there are few characters where religion does anything more than struggle with natural defect and modify what would else be far worse in this hour of trial all the native obstinacy and pertinacity of the old man's character rose and while he felt the necessity of submission it seemed impossible to submit and thus reproaching himself struggling in vain to repress the murmurs of nature repulsing from him all external sympathy his mind was tempest-tossed and not comforted it was on the still afternoon of the following sabbath that he was sent for in haste to the chamber of his son he entered and saw that the hour was come the family were all there grace and james side by side bent over the dying one and his mother sat afar off with her face hid in her apron that she might not see the death of the child the aged minister was there and the bible lay open before him the father walked to the side of the bed he stood still and gazed on the face now brightening with life and immortality the son lifted up his eyes he saw his father smiled and put out his hand i am glad you are come said he oh george to the pity don't don't smile on me so i know what is coming i have tried and tried and i can't i can't have it so and his frame shook and he sobbed audibly the room was still as death there was none that seemed able to comfort him at last the son repeated in a sweet but interrupted voice those words of man's best friend let not your heart be troubled in my father's house are many mansions yes but i can't help being troubled i suppose the lord's will must be done but it'll kill me oh father don't don't break my heart said the son much agitated i shall see you again in heaven and you shall see me again and then your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you i never shall get to heaven if i feel as i do now said the old man i cannot have it so the mild face of the sufferer was overcast i wish he saw all that i do said he in a low voice then looking towards the minister he articulated pray for us they knelt in prayer it was soothing as real prayer always must be and when they rose every one seemed more calm but the sufferer was exhausted his countenance changed he looked on his friends there was a faint whisper peace i leave with you and he was in heaven we need not dwell on what followed the seed sown by the righteous often blossoms over their grave and so was it with this good man the words of peace which he spoke unto his friends while he was yet with them came into remembrance after he was gone and though he was laid in the grave with many tears yet it was with softened and submissive hearts the lord bless him said uncle lot as he and james were standing last of all over the grave i believe my heart has gone to heaven with him and i think the lord really did know what was best after all our friend james seemed now to become the support of the family and the bereaved old man unconsciously began to transfer to him the affections that had been left vacant james said he to him one day i suppose you know that you are about the same to me as a son i hope so said james kindly well well you'll go to college next week and none o your keepin school to get along i've got enough to bring you safe out that is if you'll be careful and stiddy 
james knew the heart too well to refuse a favour in which the poor old man's mind was comforting itself he had the self-command to abstain from any extraordinary expressions of gratitude but took it kindly as a matter of course dear grace said he to her the last evening before he left home i am changed we both are altered since we first knew each other and now i am going to be gone a long time but i am sure he stopped to arrange his thoughts yes you may be sure of all those things that you wish to say and cannot said grace thank you said james then looking thoughtfully he added god help me i believe i have mind enough to be what i mean to but whatever i am or have shall be given to god and my fellow-men and then grace your brother in heaven will rejoice over me i believe he does now said grace god bless you james i don't know what would have become of us if you had not been here yes you will live to be like him and to do even more good she added her face brightening as she spoke till james thought she really must be right it was five years after this that james was spoken of as an eloquent and successful minister in the state of c and was settled in one of its most thriving villages late one autumn evening a tall bony hard-favoured man was observed making his way into the outskirts of the place hallo there he called to a man over the other side of a fence what town is this here it's farmington sir well i want to know if you know anything of a boy of mine that lives here a boy of yours who why i've got a boy here that's livin on the town and i thought i'd just look him up i don't know any boy that is living on the town what's his name why said the old man pushing his hat off from his forehead i believe they call him james benton james benton why that is our minister's name oh while i believe he is the minister come to think on't he's a boy of mine though where does he live in that white house that you see set back from the road there with all those trees round it at this instant a tall manly-looking person approached from behind have we not seen that face before it is a touch graver than of old and its lines have a more thoughtful significance but all the vivacity of james benton sparkles in that quick smile as his eye falls on the old man i thought you could not keep away from us long said he with the prompt cheerfulness of his boyhood and laying hold of both of uncle lot's hard hands they approach the gate a bright face glances past the window and in a moment grace is at the door father dear father you'd better make believe be so glad said uncle lot his eyes glistening as he spoke come come father i have authority in these days said grace drawing him towards the house so no disrespectful speeches away with your hat and coat and sit down in this great chair so ho miss grace said uncle lot you are at your old tricks ordering round as usual well if i must i must so down he sat father said grace as he was leaving them after a few days stay it's thanksgiving day next month and you and mother must come and stay with us accordingly the following month found aunt sally and uncle lot by the minister's fireside delighted witnesses of the thanksgiving presents which a willing people were pouring in and the next day they had once more the pleasure of seeing a son of theirs in the sacred desk and hearing a sermon that everybody said was the best that he ever preached and it is to be remarked that this was the standing commentary on all james's discourses so that it was evident he was going on unto perfection there's a great deal that's worth having in this air life after all said uncle lot as he sat by the coals of the bright evening fire of that day that is if we'd only take it when the lord lays it in our way yes said james and let us only take it as we should and this life will be cheerfulness and the next fullness of joy End of chapter one part two chapter two part one of the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter two love versus law part one how many kinds of beauty there are how many even in the human form there are the bloom and motion of childhood the freshness and ripe perfection of youth the dignity of manhood the softness of woman all different yet each in its kind perfect but there is none so peculiar none that bears more the image of the heavenly than the beauty of christian old age it is like the loveliness of those calm autumn days when the heats of summer are past when the harvest is gathered into the garner and the sun shines over the placid fields and fading woods which stand waiting for their last change it is a beauty more strictly moral more belonging to the soul than that of any other period of life poetic fiction always paints the old man as a christian nor is there any period where the virtues of christianity seem to find a more harmonious development the aged man who has outlived the hurry of passion who has withstood the urgency of temptation who has concentrated the religious impulses of youth into habits of obedience and love who having served his generation by the will of god now leans in helplessness on him whom once he served is perhaps one of the most faultless representations of the beauty of holiness that this world affords thoughts something like these arose in my mind as i slowly turned my footsteps from the graveyard of my native village where i had been wandering after years of absence it was a lovely spot a soft slope of ground close by a little stream that ran sparkling through the cedars and junipers beyond it while on the other side arose a green hill with the white village laid like a necklace of pearls upon its bosom there is no feature of the landscape more picturesque and peculiar than that of the graveyard that city of the silent as it is beautifully expressed by the orientals standing amid the bloom and rejoicing of nature its white stones glittering in the sun a memorial of decay a link between the living and the dead as i moved slowly from mound to mound and read the inscriptions which purported that many a money-saving man and many a busy anxious housewife and many a prattling half-blossomed child had done with care or mirth i was struck with a plain slab bearing the inscription to the memory of deacon enos dudley who died in his hundredth year my eye was caught by this inscription for in other years i had well known the person it recorded at this instant his mild and venerable form arose before me as erst it used to rise from the deacon's seat a straight close slip just below the pulpit i recollect his quiet and lowly coming into meeting precisely ten minutes before the time every sunday his tall form a little stooping his best suit of butternut-coloured sunday clothes with long flaps and wide cuffs on one of which two pins were always to be seen stuck in with the most reverent precision when seated the top of the pew came just to his chin so that his silvery placid head rose above it like the moon above the horizon his head was one that might have been sketched for a saint john bald at the top and around the temples adorned with a soft flow of bright fine hair that down his shoulders reverently spread as hoary frost with spangles doth attire the naked branches of an oak half dead he was then of great age and every line of his patient face seemed to say 
and now lord what wait i for yet still year after year was he to be seen in the same place with the same dutiful punctuality the services he offered to his god were all given with the exactness of an ancient israelite no words could have persuaded him of the propriety of meditating when the choir was singing or of sitting down even through infirmity before the close of the longest prayer that ever was offered a mighty contrast was he to his fellow officer deacon abrams a tight little tripping well-to-do man who used to sit beside him with his hair brushed straight up like a little blaze his coat buttoned up trig and close his psalm-book in hand and his quick grey eyes turned first on one side of the broad aisle and then on the other and then up into the gallery like a man who came to church on business and felt responsible for everything that was going on in the house a great hindrance was the business talent of this good little man to the enjoyments of us youngsters who perched along in a row on a low seat in front of the pulpit attempted occasionally to diversify the long hour of sermon by sundry small exercises of our own such as making our handkerchiefs into rabbits or exhibiting in a sly way the apples and gingerbread we had brought for a sunday dinner or pulling the ears of some discreet meeting-going dog who now and then would soberly pit-a-pat through the broad aisle but woe be to us during our contraband sports if we saw deacon abrams's sleek head dodging up from behind the top of the deacon's seat instantly all the apples gingerbread and handkerchiefs vanished and we all sat with our hands folded looking as demure as if we understood every word of the sermon and more too there was a great contrast between these two deacons in their services and prayers when as was often the case the absence of the pastor devolved on them the burden of conducting the duties of the sanctuary that god was great and good and that we all were sinners were truths that seemed to have melted into the heart of deacon enos so that his very soul and spirit were bowed down with them with deacon abrams it was an undisputed fact which he had settled long ago and concerning which he felt that there could be no reasonable doubt and his bustling way of dealing with the matter seemed to say that he knew that and a great many things besides deacon enos was known far and near as a very proverb for peacefulness of demeanour and unbounded charitableness in covering and excusing the faults of others as long as there was any doubt in a case of alleged evil-doing deacon enos guessed the man did not mean any harm after all and when transgression became too barefaced for this excuse he always guessed it want best to say much about it nobody could tell what they might be left to some incidents in his life will show more clearly these traits a certain shrewd landholder by the name of jones who was not well reported of in the matter of honesty sold to deacon enos a valuable lot of land and received the money for it but under various pretenses deferred giving the deed soon after he died and to the deacon's amazement the deed was nowhere to be found while this very lot of land was left by will to one of his daughters the deacon said it was very extraordinary he always knew that seth jones was considerably sharp about money but he did not think he would do such a right up and down wicked thing so the old man repaired to squire abel to state the case and see if there was any redress i kinder hate to tell of it said he but squire abel you know mr jones was was what he was even if he is dead and gone this was the nearest approach the old gentleman could make to specifying a heavy charge against the dead on being told that the case admitted of no redress deacon enos comforted himself with half soliloquizing well at any rate the land has gone to those two girls poor lone critters i hope it will do them some good there is silence we won't say much about her but suki is a nice 
pretty girl and so the old man departed leaving it as his opinion that since the matter could not be mended it was just as well not to say anything about it now the two girls here mentioned to wit silence and suki were the eldest and the youngest of a numerous family the offspring of three wives of seth jones of whom these two were the sole survivors the elder silence was a tall strong black-eyed hard-featured woman verging upon forty with a good loud resolute voice and what the irishman would call a decent notion of using it why she was called silence was a standing problem to the neighbourhood for she had more faculty and inclination for making a noise than any person in the whole township miss silence was one of those persons who have no disposition to yield any of their own rights she marched up to all controverted matters faced down all opposition held her way lustily and with good courage making men women and children turn out for her as they would for a male stage so evident was her innate determination to be free and independent that though she was the daughter of a rich man and well portioned only one swain was ever heard of who ventured to solicit her hand in marriage and he was sent off with the assurance that if he ever showed his face about the house again she would set the dogs on him but susan jones was as different from her sister as the little graceful convolvulus from the great rough stick that supports it at the time of which we speak she was just eighteen a modest slender blushing girl as timid and shrinking as her sister was bold and hardy indeed the education of poor susan had cost miss silence much painstaking and trouble and after all she said the girl would make a fool of herself she never could teach her to be up and down with people as she was when the report came to miss silence's ears that deacon enos considered himself as aggrieved by her father's will she held forth upon the subject with great strength of courage and of lungs deacon enos might be in better business than in trying to cheat orphans out of their rights she hoped he would go to law about it and see what good he would get by it a pretty church member and deacon to be sure getting up such a story about her poor father dead and gone but silence said susan deacon enos is a good man i do not think he means to injure any one there must be some mistake about it susan you are a little fool as i have always told you replied silence you would be cheated out of your eye teeth if you had not me to take care of you but subsequent events brought the affairs of these two damsels in closer connection with those of deacon enos as we shall proceed to show it happened that the next-door neighbour of deacon enos was a certain old farmer whose crabbedness of demeanour had procured for him the name of uncle jaw this agreeable surname accorded very well with the general characteristics both of the person and manner of its possessor he was tall and hard favoured with an expression of countenance much resembling a north-east rain-storm a drizzling settled sulkiness that seemed to defy all prospect of clearing off and to take comfort in its own disagreeableness his voice seemed to have taken lessons of his face in such admirable keeping was its sawing deliberate growl with the pleasing physiognomy before indicated by nature he was endowed with one of those active acute hair-splitting minds which can raise forty questions for dispute on any point of the compass and had he been an educated man he might have proved as clever a metaphysician as ever threw dust in the eyes of succeeding generations but being deprived of these advantages he nevertheless exerted himself to quite as useful a purpose in puzzling and mystifying whomsoever came in his way but his activity particularly exercised itself in the line of the law as it was his meat and drink 
and daily meditation either to find something to go to law about or to go law about something he had found there was always some question about an old rail fence that used to run a leetle more to the left hand or that was built up a leetle more to the right hand and so cut off a strip of his Metterland, or else there was some outrage of peter somebody's turkeys getting into his mowing or a squire moses's geese were to be shut up in the town pound or something equally important kept him busy from year's end to year's end now as a matter of private amusement this might have answered very well but then uncle jaw was not satisfied to fight his own battles but must needs go from house to house narrating the whole length and breadth of the case with all the says he's and says i's and the i telled him's and he telled me's which do either accompany or flow therefrom moreover he had such a marvellous facility of finding out matters to quarrel about and of letting every one else know where they too could muster a quarrel that he generally succeeded in keeping the whole neighbourhood by the ears and as good deacon enos assumed the office of peacemaker for the village uncle jaw's efficiency rendered it no sinecure the deacon always followed the steps of uncle jaw smoothing hushing up and putting matters aright with an assiduity that was truly wonderful uncle jaw himself had a great respect for the good man and in common with all the neighbourhood sought unto him for counsel though like other seekers of advice he appropriated only so much as seemed good in his own eyes still he took a kind of pleasure in dropping in of an evening to deacon enos's fire to recount the various matters which he had taken or was to take in hand at one time to narrate how he had been over the mill dam telling old granny clark that she could get the law of seth's gran about that pasture lot or else how he had told ziah bacon's widow that she had a right to shut up bill scranton's pig every time she caught him in front of her house but the grand matter of matters and the one that took up the most of uncle jaw's spare time lay in a dispute between him and squire jones the father of susan and silence for it so happened that his lands and those of uncle jaw were contiguous now the matter of dispute was on this wise on squire jones's land there was a mill which mill uncle jaw averred was always a flooding his meadow land as uncle jaw's meadow land was by nature half bog and bulrushes and therefore liable to be found in a wet condition there was always a happy obscurity as to where the water came from and whether there was at any time more there than belonged to his share so when all other subject matters of dispute failed uncle jaw recreated himself with getting up a lawsuit about his meadowland and one of these cases was in pendency when by the death of the squire the estate was left to susan and silence his daughters when therefore the report reached him that deacon enos had been cheated out of his dues uncle jaw prepared forthwith to go and compare notes therefore one evening as deacon enos was sitting quietly by the fire musing and reading with his big bible open before him he heard the premonitory symptoms of a visitation from uncle jaw on his door scraper and soon the man made his appearance after seating himself directly in front of the fire with his elbows on his knees and his hands spread out over the coals he looked up in deacon enos's mild face with his little inquisitive grey eyes and remarked by way of opening the subject well deacon old squire jones is gone at last i wonder how much good all his land will do him now yes replied deacon enos it just shows how all these things are not worth striving after we brought nothing into the world and it is certain we can carry nothing out why yes replied uncle jaw that's all very right deacon but it was strange how that old squire jones 
did hang on to things now that mill of his that was always soaking off water into these medders of mine i took and tell squire jones just how it was pretty nigh twenty times and yet he would keep it just so and now he's dead and gone there is that old gal silence is full as bad and makes more noise and she and souk have got the land but you see i mean to work it yet here uncle jaw paused to see whether he had produced any sympathetic excitement in deacon enos but the old man sat without the least emotion quietly contemplating the top of the long kitchen shovel uncle jaw fidgeted in his chair and changed his mode of attack for one more direct i heard em tell deacon enos that the squire served you something of an unhandy sort of trick about that ere lot of land still deacon enos made no reply but uncle jaw's perseverance was not so to be put off and he recommenced squire abel you see he told me how the matter was and he said he did not see as it could be mended but i took and telled him squire abel says i i'd bet pretty nigh most anything if deacon enos would tell the matter to me that i could find a hole for him to creep out at for says i i've seen daylight through more twistical cases than that afore now still deacon enos remained mute and uncle jaw after waiting a while recommenced with but rally deacon i should like to hear the particulars i have made up my mind not to say anything more about that business said deacon enos in a tone which though mild was so exceedingly definite that uncle jaw felt that the case was hopeless in that quarter he therefore betook himself to the statement of his own grievances why you see deacon he began at the same time taking the tongs and picking up all the little brands and disposing them in the middle of the fire you see two days arter the funeral for i didn't rally like to go any sooner i stepped up to hash over the matter with old silence for as to suki she ha'n't no more to do with such things than our white kitten now you see squire jones just afore he died he took away an old rail fence of his'n that lay between his land and mine and began to build a new stone wall and when i come to measure i found he had took and put a'most the whole width of the stone wall on to my land when there ought not to have been more than half of it come there now you see i could not say a word to squire jones because just before i found it out he took and died and so i thought i'd speak to old silence and see if she meant to do anything about it cause i knew pretty well she wouldn't and i tell you if she didn't put it on to me we had a regular pitched battle the old gal i thought she would a screamed herself to death i don't know but she would but just then poor suki came in and looked so frightened and scary suki is a pretty gal and looked so trembling and delicate that it's kinder a shame to plague her and so i took and come away for that time here uncle jaw perceived a brightening in the face of the good deacon and felt exceedingly comforted that at last he was about to interest him in his story but all this while the deacon had been in a profound meditation concerning the ways and means of putting a stop to a quarrel that had been his torment from time immemorial and just at this moment a plan had struck his mind which our story will proceed to unfold the mode of settling differences which had occurred to the good man was one which has been considered a specific in reconciling contending sovereigns and states from early antiquity and the deacon hoped it might have a pacifying influence even in so unpromising a case as that of miss silence and uncle jaw in former days deacon enos had kept the district school for several successive winters and among his scholars was the gentle susan jones then a plump rosy little girl with blue eyes curly hair and the sweetest disposition in the world there was also little joseph adams the only son of uncle jaw a fine healthy robust boy who used to spell the longest words make the best snowballs and poplar whistles and read the loudest and fastest in the columbian orator of any boy at school 
little joe inherited all his father's sharpness with a double share of good humour so that though he was for ever effervescing in the way of one funny trick or another he was a universal favourite not only with the deacon but with the whole school master joseph always took little susan jones under his especial protection drew her to school on his sled helped her out with all the long sums in her arithmetic saw to it that nobody pillaged her dinner-basket or knocked down her bonnet and resolutely whipped or snowballed any other boy who attempted the same gallantries years passed on and uncle jaw had sent his son to college he sent him because as he said he had a right to send him just as good a right as squire abel or deacon abrams to send their boys and so he would send him it was the remembrance of his old favourite joseph and his little pet susan that came across the mind of deacon enos and which seemed to open a gleam of light in regard to the future so when uncle jaw had finished his prelection the deacon after some meditation came out with rally they say that your son is going to have the valedictory in college though somewhat startled at the abrupt transition uncle jaw found the suggestion too flattering to his pride to be dropped so with a countenance grimly expressive of his satisfaction he replied why yes yes i don't see no reason why a poor man's son ha'n't as much right as any one to be at the top if he can get there just so replied deacon enos he was always the boy for larning and for nothing else continued uncle jaw put him to farm and couldn't make nothing of him if i set him to hoeing corn or hilling potatoes i'd always find him stopping to chase hop toads or off after chip squirrels but set him down to a book and there he was that boy larnt reading the quickest of any boy that ever i saw it wasn't a month after he began his a b a b s before he could read in the fox and the brambles and in a month more he could clatter off his chapter in the testament as fast as any of them and you see in college it's just so he has riz right up to be first and he is coming home week after next said the deacon meditatively the next morning as deacon enos was eating his breakfast he quietly remarked to his wife sally i believe it was week after next you were meaning to have your quilting why i never told you so what alive makes you think that deacon dudley i thought that was your calculation said the good man quietly why no to be sure i can have it and may be it's the best of any time if we can get black dinah to come and help about the cakes and pies i guess we will finally i think it's likely who had better replied the deacon and we will have all the young folks here End of chapter two part one